Hello and welcome to the Justin Center Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper, and thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. I do just want to give you all a quick reminder, as I always do, that Justin Center is supported by donors. So if you have contributed or if you have benefited from the things that you have learned and gained information you have gained here, uh, please do try to... Uh, put it in your just your regular monthly budget that you give us something to help us out. Any amount really does help. You can go to our donation page at justincenter.org. Uh, you can sign up for Patreon. And if you sign up on Patreon, you get access to our Discord server. There are plenty of other ways to give as well, not just through Patreon. We're of have a 1c3 nonprofit, which means that any gifts that you give to us are tax deductible. Uh, well, today on the program, we're going to be beginning this new series of videos and podcasts, which I am titling Just End Center Essentials. And as I've been thinking through this updates that I've done on the YouTube channel and that we've done as a broader organization, one of the things that, that I have been thinking through is trying to get some of our just fundamental convictions as an organization and myself as a, podca a podcast host as well, uh, to, to trying to get some of those fundamental things really laid out as clearly as possible. And as I went through my materials recently, as I've been doing, been putting everything into playlists, so everything is organized. So if there's a particular topic you want to look at, you can go to those playlists because I know there are a lot of videos in this channel, and probably a, it's a lot to navigate sometimes, if you're, if, especially if you're interested in particular things. So everything right now should be organized into playlists by topic. Um, but one of the things I realized is, you know, I don't have just a basic explanation of what Lutheranism is in, you know, an hour, uh, in one talk. And I'm talking about Lutheran things all over the place, but there is no kind of one singular place that you can go to say, hey, what are Lutherans? What exactly do Lutherans believe? What's their history? And so if uh, if you, you're interested in what Lutherans believe, who they are, or you have somebody that you know that you're talking to that's interested in that, uh, then this hopefully will be a helpful guide for you to some of the basics. I've also been contacted by a couple different educators, and one was in uh, a college with college age students, uh, and the other was with high school students who have asked, can I get something that I can use to explain Lutheranism to my students? And this is professors that aren't Lutheran, uh, or professor one professor, one teacher, but ones that just have students that ask a lot of questions and they're trying to, you know, as part of their curriculum, go through different denominational differences and where these different groups came from. So people have asked, you know, is there something that you have that would be a useful guide? So that's what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> so, uh, well, with that, we're going to be uh, delving then into the specifics of what exactly Lutheranism is. Now, again, this is a brief overview, so don't expect... Uh, everything to be discussed here. There's plenty to discuss, and I've got hours and hours of content to discuss on Lutheran history and, and who we are, what we do, what we believe. Um, and I, there's going to be a follow-up on this as well, which is specifically going to be Lutheran theology. So this one is broad overview, history and theology, what Lutheran means. Then we're going to do a separate video on the, the theology. Okay, so what is a Lutheran? Now, to, to define what a Lutheran is, just like probably any tradition or any movement or any group of people that do anything, there are debates about exactly what uh, what defines precisely what a Lutheran is. But what I'm going to be using here is the basic paradigm that was set forward by Charles Porterfield Krauth. So if you're looking at the slideshow, there's an image here of Charles Krauth. His years are 1823 to 1883. Krauth was a an American Lutheran theologian who wrote a book called The Conservative Reformation. So we're going to talk about what conservative reformation means exactly. Uh, but essentially, what he was trying to do in his own context is look at the broader landscape of religious traditions within the United States and answer the question, where exactly do Lutherans fit here? So the, the distinctions that he gives, I think, are really a really helpful starting point to say, who are Lutherans in comparison to these various other Christian groups? So we've got first this kind of dichotomy that, that he sets up between uh, traditionalism and then what we might call radicalism, different ways to, different terms you could, you could use. But these are the two I'm using here. And this is that there are different tendencies among Christians, just as there are in politics and culture and all sorts of other things as well. But there are tendencies to either veer toward that which is traditional, that which has been, you know, inherited, that which is older, 
or a tendency to say that we need to kind of break free from the past and we need to capture something that is new and, and better. So you see this in, you know, more conservative versus progressive tendencies in politics, but we're not talking about politics here. We're talking theology specifically. Uh, and what Kraut is going to say is that there is a kind of traditionalism that is inherent within the Roman Catholic system. So if we're going to talk about traditionalism versus radicalism, we've got basically a spectrum. We've got some, you know, one end here that's radicalism. The farthest end is probably, you know, Socinianism or Unitarianism or something. And then the farthest end in, in terms of traditionalism, we might say today is the Latin mass Catholics, right? those who very much value that which is, which is old. So in, in Kraut's day, this is pre-Vatican II, so Rome is very different. But at this time, traditionalism was was really Rome's claim. They were holding on to the older traditions, the medieval traditions. There's going to be a question that Lutherans pose as to, as to how old those traditions actually are, because it's usually going to be the, the Lutheran argument that the Roman traditions are actually medieval, not not patristic. They're not they're not as early as as Rome claims. It's really a holding on to particularly medieval traditions, but nonetheless. So we might include Eastern Orthodoxy here as well. Kraut does not because there wasn't a large movement of, you know, people converting to Eastern Orthodoxy within in an American context, at least. And there, there definitely is that today. So we've got these kind of traditionalist tendencies. But then on the other hand, you've got the a, a kind of radicalism. Now, the term radical reformation is used often to refer specifically to the Anabaptists. So if you're looking at the various groups that come out of, of the broader Protestant Reformation, there, there are a number of different approaches to reform because all of these groups, we're talking Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, Anabaptist. Okay, those are the four groups that show up at the time of the Reformation as the, the four core Protestant groups. And everyone else since then that is Protestant in any sense at all really is an offshoot of one of those four groups. So we have among those four groups, all of them have kind of different approaches to how it is that we are to reform the church. Now, all of them are agreed that there are corruptions that are happening within the medieval church and that there are things that need to be changed. There are, there are doctrines that have arisen in especially the late medieval period, if we look at things like indulgences that do not have any scriptural backing whatsoever, and that to be faithful to scripture, we need to, to alter those things. Uh, there is agreement that there is broad moral corruption that's going on in the church at that time. So the radicals are those who essentially take the position that we kind of need to start over, that we need to just throw out the traditions of, of the church, what is developed into late medieval Roman Catholicism. The, the, the idea here is that the errors are so bad, we should just kind of throw them away and basically start over. We can just go back to scripture, go back to the book of Acts and say, we need to be the church of the book of Acts again, and, and simply throw out the tradition that has been received. So that's the that's radicalism. So you have the Anabaptists, which would today be groups like the Mennonites and the Amish being the most well-known. I put non-denominationalism in that camp as well. I think modern day non-denominationalism is, is something that really doesn't grow out of historic Christian traditions. It is something that sees itself as autonomous. There is no structural hierarchy of a non-denominational church beyond the local church. That's why it's called non-denominational. And, and the, there is no tie to history, historic worship. Now, of course, non-denominational churches, there's, there's a spectrum. So we're talking broadly here. Um, then you have the Sassinians who end up becoming the most radical group. The Sassinians end up rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity, the ecumenical creeds. Uh, they argue that every truth of scripture basically needs to be proven by, by mere reason. That then kind of develops or morphs into what you see later as Unitarianism. Then you have, uh, on the other hand, this group that I'm calling the, the, the kind of moderate reform. Those who want to say, we really do need to reform the church. We are going to get rid of excesses in the church. But they are also willing to, to say that the traditions in terms of worship, say, that are not directly commanded in scripture, those must be discarded. And you have something called the regulative principle of worship, that there is going to be much more of an emphasis here on getting rid of 
elements of the service. However, these Christians are going to say that we still hold to the ecumenical creeds and we still hold ourselves to be part of that historic church. So the, these moderate reform groups are the ones that we usually refer to as reformed or, or Presbyterian. So this is really John Calvin's Reformation. So the major figure for the radicals would be someone like uh, Menno Simons, the founder of the Mennonites. For moderate reform, we're going to say someone like John Calvin. Someone like Ulrich Zwingli, though he is reformed, an essential figure for the reformed church, he's kind of between those as well. So I, I don't know that I'd put him quite in radicalism, but he's not quite at the moderate reform place either. We're talking a spectrum here. But with all of that background, where do Lutherans fit then? What Krauth is going to say is that the Lutheran approach is conservative reform, which is why he calls it the conservative reformation. In other words, the Lutherans see themselves, we see ourselves as the church Catholic. And there was never a desire to split off from the church of Rome. There was never a strong desire to break fellowship. However, we were forced into that position due to the stances that Rome took and the excommunication of, of Martin Luther. And the conservative reform says we, we keep tradition, we respect tradition, we love our tradition. However, we recognize that tradition is not infallible in the way that scripture is infallible. And so when we are coming to certain things that are going on in the church, like the practice of indulgences or the treasury of merit, and we look at the development of these ideas and look at scripture and say, look, there is no scriptural precedent at all for these doctrines. In fact, these doctrines are pretty clearly opposed to significant teachings of scripture. At that point, if we have to make this choice of tradition or scripture, we should pick scripture every time. And so the conservative reformation, and I'm including Anglicans there as, as well, but I'm not going to get into their Lutherans and Anglicans are distinct, but they do have a more conservative approach to reformation. The, the conservative reformation says there are corruptions in the church and, and we need to use scripture to root out corruptions and false teaching and false doctrine. However, we retain the traditions of the church as they have been developed, which is why when you go to a Lutheran service, or an Anglican service as well, you're going to see something that looks much more similar to what you see in a Roman Catholic mass than say, if you go to your local Presbyterian church. So that's that then is the basic background to say who exactly are Lutherans. If we're gonna define who Lutherans are as a group compared to other Christian groups, that conservative reform ideology, I think undergirds a lot of how we view our theology and practice in general. Now, the next point we're going to talk about is the life of Martin Luther. You can't really talk about Lutheranism without Martin Luther. And I do want to say, just to clarify, Lutherans are not simply Christians who follow everything Martin Luther did. <laughs> we are not just disciples of Martin Luther. The name Lutheran is simply a pejorative term that Rome used to criticize those who, were, who, who held to Luther's doctrine during the era of the Reformation. And the name just kind of stuck. So when you hear the name Lutheran, no, that does not mean that we just follow Martin Luther, a man, or that we just believe everything Luther said, or that you know we can never disagree with Martin Luther as if he's some kind of infallible theological source. Um, and, and there are plenty of other names that Lutherans like to use for themselves as well. Initially, we were just the evangelicals until evangelicalism became something very different than that. And some Lutherans like the term evangelical Catholics to emphasize both of the, that gospel centeredness as well as our Catholicity. That name probably sums up Lutheranism better than anything else. I kind of wish we would just stick with that name. But nonetheless, Lutheran's a historic name. It's kind of what what was placed on us. So it is it is kind of just what it is, right? So so we've got the name Lutheran. Um, so but regardless of of that, that we don't follow Martin Luther, he is the founding foundational figure of what becomes the, the Lutheran tradition, as opposed to the later post-Tridentine Roman Catholic tradition. And by Tridentine, I mean after the Council of Trent, which is a counter-Reformation council that declares a number of dogmas in opposition to the Reformation. Now, Martin Luther is born in Eisleben in 1483 in, in uh, Germany, what was then the Holy Roman Empire, which was a kind of not really much of an empire, not really Roman, not that holy either, uh, but, <laughs> but it was 
uh, <laughs> portions of Northern Europe that's are that that had a kind of loose empire, and you had a, a, a prince that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, Charles here, and then there were a bunch of other, uh, where well, you have an emperor, Charles, and then you have a bunch of local princes that kind of serve as rulers under the emperor over different regions of Germany is really what we're talking about here. Um, Luther studied at the University of Erfurt from 1501 to 1505. 1505 really b becomes the primary year for Luther in terms of shifting his the direction of his life, where he ends up going. And in some ways, you can kind of take Luther's life and put it into these five-year periods because 1510 is going to be a significant year. And, you know, 1515 to 1517, 1520 is going to write some of his great treatises. Um, but 1505, Luther begins law school. And he drops out almost immediately after he starts, but he goes there at the urging of his father. His father wants him to be a lawyer. This is a time where there's a rising middle class, and he's really part of that educated middle class at this time. And the story is rather famous that Luther is riding home from school one day on horseback, and he almost gets struck by lightning. And he cries out to St. Anne and, and sees this as basically a sign from God that he needs to do something better with his life. He needs to do something important and holy. So he gives himself to the life of the monastic. So he joins a monastery. So he, he vows to St. Anne. And St. Anne is the purported mother of Mary, uh, this Blessed Virgin Mary, by the way. So he vows to become a monk. He joins St. Augustine's monastery in Erfurt in July of 1505, named after the great church father, the great early Christian writer. It's going to have a significant influence on Luther as well as the rest of the Reformation traditions, or at least the Lutheran and Reformed uh, traditions, not the Anabaptists so much. But he is, he's part of the Augustinian monastery. He joins in 1505. And while he's in the monastery, Luther struggles quite profoundly with issues of, of guilt. He is a very guilt-ridden person. If you look at Luther's life today through a kind of psychoanalytic lens, and a lot of people have done that, <laughs> because he's a, he's a figure who wrote a lot about his personal struggles. So when, when psychoanalysis became a popular discipline, a lot of people chose to look at the life of Luther. But probably today, he would be diagnosed with something like OCD. He was somebody who was quite obsessive about the nature of his, of his sin. He constantly struggled with the reality of, of guilt, and you may just say it's, well, that's just because he had psychological issues. And, and like I said, I think he probably may have been diagnosed with like OCD if he was around today. I have OCD, so I'm not, I don't know. It maybe seems normal to me. But, but the, the question then is, was he being irrational, though, in, in, in his, his guilt? And the, the answer that I would give is, if the medieval theology that Luther was taught was true, I don't know how rationally you could not end up in the kind of situation that he ended up in. And so he really struggles with, with guilt. He's spending hours in the confessional. And to give some context here, it was the approach of the church at this time. It was the, it was the theology of the church that, that said that everyone who commits sins must confess, confess sins in a confessional and be forgiven by the priest. Now, that by itself is not a significant issue until you get into the specifics. Because Lutherans are actually going to retain this idea of private absolution. We're not going to make it a necessity, though, in the same way. But what Rome starts to say at this time is that every single sin must be confessed for it to be forgiven. So there is no general confession of sins. You don't get to go to the priest and say, look, I've got all of these sins, hidden faults is... David says in the Psalms, which is going to be quoted a lot by Luther, that, you know, we've got these, you're not just saying, I've got these sins, these are the ones I can remember, and, and there are plenty that I don't remember, and the priest will just say, I, I forgive you or I absolve you. No, you actually are required to confess every single sin. And Luther understood the biblical reality that sin is deep. <laughs> sin is not just these outward transgressions that are obvious. Things like, stealing or committing adultery. Instead, sin is, is something that lies underneath that. Sin is something of the heart. Sin includes, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, 
the adultery of the heart, the, the, the lust, the hatred that you have in your heart, the bitterness you have in your heart. In other words, sin is an ever-present reality because it, it does not only include these outward actions, but it includes the life of the mind, it includes thoughts, it includes the affections and desires of your heart that are disordered. And if that's the case, and if sin really is this ever-present reality that you're carrying with you every single day, the question is, how can you possibly confess all of that? And Luther would spend hours confessing sin and try to remember every single sin he, could poss he possibly could. And at the end of his time in the confessional, he, he says that you know, he hears the words that he's forgiven, Tabes Alvo, and at that point, he feels this joy, he's forgiven, his burdens are taken away, and then just a little while later, he starts to remember, wait a minute, there's this other you know, bad thought that I had here that I forgot to confess. And then all of a sudden, this cycle would, would start again. And so, in order to deal with this problem of guilt, he engaged then in, in excessive asceticism, meaning that he really harmed his body. He would go sleep out in the cold. He would wear what are called hair shirts that are these kind of painful, itchy shirts that you'd wear to, to hurt your body. He thought that he could discipline his body as best as he possibly could, and perhaps then he could take care of the reality of the guilt of his sin. He could stop sinning so much if he, if he was as, as, you know, the strictest monk he could possibly be. So, he is ordained to the priesthood in the year 1507, and basically right after that, he is sent to go teach. He's sent to go learn scripture, get a degree in theology, and, and to teach. And Johann von Staupitz, that's that was the head of the monastery here. So, he is really Luther's spiritual father. He understands Luther's guilt. Luther's been confessing to him regularly. And, and Staupitz had a significant amount of, of spiritual pastoral wisdom. Staupitz rightly continually pointed Luther to the cross of Jesus, the place where God's love and mercy is to be found. And in order for Luther to kind of get out of this cycle of guilt, Staupitz sent him to study theology, thinking that he can, maybe he'll, he'll deal with these issues as he is brought to the source of, of, of God's word, where truth is to be found. And, and ultimately, Staupitz was right to do that. And we see that it's Luther's wrestlings with scripture that lead then to the Reformation. So, Luther begins teaching at the University of Wittenberg. He's a professor of theology. He starts he starts lecturing there some in 1508. He receives his doctorate there in 1512, and he ends up staying there for the rest of his career. So, the University of Wittenberg is where, where Luther is. Strangely enough, you know, you think of Luther, you really think of him more as a pastor than anything else when you read his writings, but if he were alive today and you were to give him any, you know, title, whether it's in theology or, or in the academy, he probably would be a professor of Old Testament, because that's where he really lectured the most. As, as odd as that is, that's probably not, not what you think. Um, so, then you have the, the key event that leads to the Reformation here, and that is the controversy over indulgences. And indulgences, to put it briefly, this is a practice that arose in the late medieval period, which essentially said that someone in the church would be able to pay money to the church, and in response, the church would give the forgiveness of sins. They would remit specifically the penalty of sins. Now, there's a bit of a complicated system behind this that develops. It's, it's more complex than just that, so let me, I'll give you the short of it <laughs> as quickly as I possibly can. In, in medieval theology, you have this development of different kinds of sins. You have mortal sins versus venial sins. Mortal sins essentially cut you off from a state of grace. So that if you commit a mortal sin, you are no longer in a state of grace. You are no longer saved, maybe as some evangelicals would say. You are you are no longer, you know, in Christ. And if you commit that mortal sin, that's where you need to to go confess to a priest, and then you're forgiven and you're reconciled to God. However, you also have these venial sins. Now, venial sins are bad. They're no sin is good. However, those venial sins don't cut you off from a state of grace. So you're not totally cut off from salvation, totally cut off from Christ when you, when you commit a venial sin. However, those venial sins do incur a penalty. And that 
penalty is what's called the temporal penalty for sins. So there is a, an eternal penalty for sins, which is that you are eternally cut off from God. So you're cut off from grace. And then there is a temporal penalty, penalty for sin, which is something like doing jail time you know, in your life if you commit a crime or paying restitution to somebody if you steal something from them, right? If you steal from somebody and, and you say you steal money from someone and you spend all of that money, well, and you confess to that person what you did and you feel remorse, perhaps that person will forgive you for stealing the money, but they may still want the money back because they need it. <laughs> so so you may be paying restitution for a number of years to to repay your debt. That's, the, that's really what Rome is saying with this distinction between the eternal punishments and the temporal punishments. Now, the way that those temporal punishments in medieval theology are are paid off, the way that that they are um, are dealt with is through penance as one way. You know, there are multiple ways that they can be dealt with. Penance is essentially a certain work that you are given that the priest assigns to you as a way for you to work off those temporal penalties. So it may be you say this many rosaries or our fathers or you know, maybe going on a pilgrimage. There are certain things like pilgrimages, like going to see relics that remit more penalty than other things. Going on a crusade would be a great example. This was a significant motivation that the church used to get people to sign up for, for a crusade. And you kind of get that. So one of the ways, though, that, that this was dealt with was through the, uh, the buying of indulgences, which says that instead of having to work this off or instead of having to spend hundreds, maybe thousands of years in purgatory working off the penalty for your sins, because ultimately, whatever penalty you haven't paid off for your venial sins in Roman theology, that's what you're going to have to pay off in purgatory. So it's kind of like your, your jail time to repay your debt until it's done and then you get to heaven. And so this, this, this threat kind of of purgatory loomed over people's heads throughout the medieval period, this idea that, well, I might die, and people are dying all over the place, there are plagues all the time. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you may die, and if you die at any time, you know, perhaps a plague comes through town unexpectedly and, you know, you die and half your family dies. Well, then you are shot right into purgatory and you may spend 2,000 years suffering before you get to see the glory of God before his face, before his throne, partake of the beatific vision. And so you see then that there was a real desire, a real motivation to do whatever you can to make that time go away or at least lessen it. And indulgences were a way for you to purchase, essentially, that suffering that you would otherwise have to pay off in purgatory. Largely, those indulgences were bought for those who you loved who passed away. So your mother passes away, your father passes away, and the church says, hey, your, your father is suffering terribly right now, and he's going to be suffering for hundreds, maybe thousands of years unless you give the church X amount of money. And so there's motivation to give money. Now, this is all very quite manipulative, of course. <laughs> Um, and, and some of this does still exist in Rome today, though it has taken on different forms and different nuances. So this uh, practice of indulgences was enough of a problem as it was, but there's one particular event, one particular indulgence seller that stands at the root of the Reformation. And that is a guy named John Tetzel. And to give some brief political background of what's going on here, uh, St. Peter's Basilica at this time, a lot of people still go travel to see St. Peter's. It's, it's quite a beautiful church, uh, but which was bought off of the, the money and probably blood of, uh, of peasants. Uh, pretty horrible. But uh, St. Peter's Basilica was, was being built by Rome, and the church was in significant debt. In other words, they didn't have any money to pay this off. The previous popes had spent a lot of money in the Vatican's treasury. A lot of it was for things that were uh, not quite holy, I'll just say. You can read some details yourself and some histories of the papacy. It's pretty horrific. And, and everybody acknowledges, by the way, how horrific a lot of this was. So you have an instance then where the church is out of money, but they're building this basilica. And there are political reasons why it was important as a statement to the Islamic world, which was encroaching on Europe at, at the time. But Albrecht, Archbishop of Mainz, who had quite a bit of money, decided that he was going to put up put up the money. He was going to put up money to 
uh, to pay for the basilica. However, now he was he was in significant debt and needed that debt to be repaid. And he spoke with the Pope at the time, who was Pope Leo X, regarding what was going on here and, and regarding debt. And they basically came up with a plan that indulgences would be a great way to, to repay that debt. And so they sent this indulgence preacher, John Tetzel, in, in 1516 to go throughout the Holy Roman Empire and sell indulgences. Now, Tetzel did indeed even get censured by the Roman Church. He was as extreme as can be in terms of indulgences. He went far beyond anybody before him. And he his, he's famous for using the, the particular phrase, uh, when a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And so he guilts all of these people to say, uh, you know, your your grandfather is suffering, suffering terribly, and just for a little bit of money, you'll be able to free him from that suffering. And he's he's very graphic in his descriptions of suffering and purgatory. You know, if you've ever seen like the Luther movie, and there are multiple, but the you know two thousand five, whatever year that was. It, uh, you know, there's a scene where like Tetzel sticks his hand in fire and it's burning and he's using that as an illustration. Like he's that extreme. And, and that's a good visual of, of what Tetzel was really like. So he does even say at one point, supposedly, that God would even forgive the the one who violated the mother of God if if she was going to give an indulgence. I mean, it's it's pretty wild stuff. Well, Luther encounters Tetzel. He hears about congregants that he's preaching to that's are buying indulgences, and because of that, Luther's mad and, and, and believes that this is a complete abuse. It's an abuse of, of the forgiveness of sins, it's an abuse of money, it's an abuse of the church. And so he writes up what we know at now is the beginning of, of the Reformation, which are the 95 Theses. So Luther writes these 95 Theses. Theses, theological theses like this, were a very common thing to put together. It's not like Luther wrote these 95 theses as some kind of wild, extreme thing to change the church forever. It really wasn't the point. It was simply a series of theses to debate, and public theological debates happened regularly. So that as a professor, this is what he's supposed to do, right? You're supposed to put points of discussion. You're supposed to challenge things. So you get somebody who is going to support the other side, and you get into a public debate about this or that. So he nails the, the theses to the church door uh, of the All Saints Church in, in Wittenberg. Some people have challenged whether that actually happened historically, but according to Philip Melanchthon, it did happen. And then these theses, which, by the way, the church door is, is basically a kind of community bulletin board at the time. So it wasn't the same as this isn't permission for you to go out to a local church you don't like and start nailing things to their door. This is a community bulletin board somewhere that people are going to see. There's a university here. It's a university town that is going to lead to discussion and debate. And these, these theses were quickly printed, supposedly by a couple of his students that read this and thought it was very important to get this, this into print. The printing press had just been invented at this time, uh, the Gutenberg printing press. And we, we could spend a very long time discussing all of the things that kind of had to happen historically, politically, technologically that led to the Reformation. But that's a really important one to keep in mind. So that now when someone writes something like this, which otherwise at another time may have simply led to a public debate in the town square, and then that would have been it. Now that the printing press is, is available, this is quickly spread all over the place. It's... Though it's written in Latin, as theological disputations were at the time, it is also translated into German, and then it's sent out all over the place. Luther writes a commentary on the 95 Theses to explain the points that he's getting across here. He actually dedicates the commentary to Pope Leo at the time, because Luther did not know the corruption of the church. He really assumed the best of the leadership of the church. He assumed that what Tetzel was doing was something that was totally unknown by the, the Pope at the time, which was not the case. <laughs> and Luther would speak quite differently about the papacy in years to come. But at least at this time, he, he, he simply believes that he's informing the Pope of abuses that the Pope would be very concerned about because he's assuming that the intentions of the Pope at the time were actually sincere. Now, if you read the 95 Theses today, they're, they're basically 
promoting medieval Roman Catholic theology. It's not like the 95 Theses have all of these Reformation doctrines and themes. The major theme of the Theses, if anything, is repentance. And repentance is a real central theme for Luther. So the 95 Theses begin with the first Theses saying that the entire life of the Christian should be one of repentance. And the fear that Luther has here with the indulgences, at least one of them, is that people are going to view their Christian lives not in terms of actual repentance in the heart of a daily turning from sin, a daily turning to God for forgiveness and grace. Instead, they're going to turn the Christian life into this kind of transactional thing of, well, I gave my, my money to the indulgences and I kind of can now do whatever I want. So for Luther, the Christian life is about this daily repentance. Now, this then leads to the beginnings of the Reformation. And we're not going to explore the entirety of the life of Luther here. I'm trying to just give basic background to what leads to the Reformation, to what leads to then Lutheranism. Um, so in 1520, Luther writes probably his most important Reformation works. And these are, there are three of these. There's the, Bab uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church in that treatise. And these are pretty short, by the way. If you want to explore the writings of Luther, these are the best place to start, especially the first two. The third one's, you got to know a little bit about the political situation in Germany to, to really get what Luther's talking about. But uh, the first one, the Babylonian captivity of the church, is an overview of the sacraments in the church. And Luther explores the sacraments in terms of abuses that have happened that have developed over time, as well as what is the scriptural background of the sacraments. And Luther essentially comes to the conclusion that there are really only three things that should really be called sacraments, at least in, in the truest, strictest sense of the word sacrament. And that is holy baptism, the Lord's Supper, and then absolution, or the, the forgiveness of sins through the mouth of the, of the pastor or priest, because those things all have a scriptural backing, and the others don't necessarily. And and, and they do have scriptural backing, backing in that, yes, marriage obviously is scriptural and ordination is scriptural, but they don't contain what he defines as the three elements of what constitutes a sacrament. More detail in that is going to be in the talk that I do on Lutheran theology. So I'll leave it there and not go too much farther. Um, then there's On Christian Liberty, which is a wonderful work, the, probably the best thing Luther ever wrote in my view. It is just a about the Christian life and what it means to be free in Christ and free to serve to serve your neighbor. So it really ties together themes of justification or the forgiveness of sins with how we live for the sake of others. We live for the sake of our neighbor. Then addressed to the German nobility or to the nobility of the German nation is a treatise that is really pleading with the the German princes to aid him in in this reform movement. Now, in 1520, the, the Pope writes an encyclical, Exurge Domine, meaning Arise, O Lord. The encyclicals generally are named after the first few words in, in the encyclical. And, and this starts with, Arise, O Lord, a boar has entered into thy vineyard. And he's referring to Luther as this, this evil boar who has, <laughs> who has entered the vineyard of the church and is destroying the church. And Luther receives this from, from the Pope. By this time, Luther certainly knows the Pope is, doesn't agree with what he's saying. <laughs> he recognizes that actually the Pope is behind all this stuff in the first place. And so he ends up burning this when he receives it, this, this papal bull. So it's burned in 1520. It's burned publicly. And there are a number of other documents that are burned with it. Um, he, his official excommunication then comes in the next year, in, in 1521, and which is just the, the next month, actually, after his, his burning uh, of, of this. So he's, he doesn't repent, so he's, he's excommunicated. Uh, this then leads to the Diet of Worms, uh, spelled as Worms. Uh, the Diet of Worms is, is essentially a council diet, meaning a, a council or a synod. That it was a political meeting in 1521. Worms is a city in Germany. And this was presided over not by the Pope, but by Emperor Charles V. And the ban that came from the Pope was to be, politically, it had to be enforced by the Emperor. And there is a strong alliance here at this time between church and state. 
Luther is given the promise of safe conduct, which means they, they tell him, well, you're going to come to this council. We promise that you're not going to be harmed. No one's going to kill you. You'll be protected. They weren't going to do that. <laughs> just, they just weren't, which is why Luther afterwards, we know that because they've done this before with, with Huss. They promised him safe passage as well, and they burned him at the stake uh, pretty horrifically. So Luther then decides to hatch a plan that he is going to basically be kind of kidnapped. But really, these are his friends taking him away, and he goes to the, the Fortberg Castle where he spends some time translating the Bible. Um, and in, in that movie, if you watch like the 2000, I think it's 2005, it's somewhere around there. If, but if you watch that movie, the, in, in the scene, Luther has no idea what's going on. It makes it more dramatic for a movie. But in, in reality, Luther was part of this plan because he knew that he was in danger. So... Uh, essentially, he's at the Diet of Worms. This is a place where you know Emperor Charles is there. You have a guy named Johann Eck. Eck is someone who had debated Luther previously and, be, and really is an opponent of Luther for a significant period of time. And Eck stands there with Luther. Luther is, is, is at the Diet. A number of Luther's books are laid out. And Eck essentially asks if Luther, if he will recant if he will say that his writings are wrong, say that he's he was wrong, he will repent from them, and he'll get rid of his writings. And he no longer teaches the things that were taught in there. Now, initially, Luther actually asks for an extra day to consider this, and he's given an extra day, and he spends that night in prayer. We have this written prayer from him, seeing the struggle that, that, he, that he has there. And in struggle, I don't think it's just fear of death. It's really fear of, I want to make sure that what I'm really doing is right. And the, the next day he comes back and Luther gives the, the very famous here I stand speech where, you know, he says, unless I am convinced by uh, sacred scripture or by plain reason, I cannot, I will not recant. Here I stand. I could do no other. That's only part of the, the, the talk. The here I stand phrase, there's debate about whether Luther actually said that because there are also multiple conflicting accounts there. But uh so the two most famous events in Luther's life may not have happened, but whatever. I like the stories anyway. <laughs> and we do have accounts of them, so it doesn't mean they, they definitively didn't happen, but they're not. When you get different accounts of something, some accounts don't mention it, so people debate whether it was really there or not. But hey, I, I like the word, and, and there's, or I like the phrase. It's, it's a great phrase, and it's the name of a great Luther biography by Roland Bainton. All right, so that's the, the basic historical overview of Luther's life, the Lutheran Reformation, where we come from. Now, the the Lutheran Reformation is not just defined by, as I said at the beginning here, Luther's theology. So we don't subscribe to everything Luther said. It's not like every Lutheran pastor, just when we're preparing our sermons, I just go to Luther's writings and say, well, I got to find out what the text means. I'll only look at Luther. <laughs> not that I don't consult Luther, but I also consult, you know, Chrysostom and Augustine and other later Lutheran writers, Kretzmann and, and uh, yeah, all sorts of other. Lenski is another one I look at. Bernard of Clairvaux. I don't know. All sorts of people. <laughs> so, um, but what does define a Lutheran doctrinally? This is the Lutheran Confessions, and the Lutheran Confessions are a series of documents that were written within the era of of the Reformation that contain the doctrinal points that that are adhered to by the Lutheran reformers. So if you want to know what a Lutheran believes, it's pretty easy. Just look at the confessions of the Lutheran church. Now I want to make one clarification here. A Lutheran, and we use the term confessional Lutherans, that's how, what I used to refer to myself, and oftentimes the phrase confessional Lutheran means I am a Lutheran, and what that means is that I adhere to the doctrine as laid out in these confessional documents something concrete and clear about what makes a Lutheran and what makes one not a Lutheran. And that, and that is our, our doctrine, our doctrinal heritage, an affirmation of, of Lutheran doctrine. So you, you don't get to say, I'm a Lutheran, and then you know disagree with half the things in the Augsburg Confession. <laughs> so you may think some things in Lutheranism are cool, but like just by name, that doesn't really fit. You're something else. You're Anglican, because they don't have you know clear enough doctrinal statements. Okay. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm taking a pot shot. I love you Anglicans, I really do. Uh, but <laughs> but we, we do tend to be more um, doctrinally clear and strict about certain things, which I see as an asset, but I understand other people also see it as the biggest negative about Lutherans is that we're too dogmatic 
Ah, I like being dogmatic. It's fun. Okay, so uh, what are the Lutheran confessions? And what are these? Oh, what I was in the middle of saying, sorry, a clarification. Uh, when we affirm the teaching here, what we're affirming is the doctrines contained in the Book of Concord, which is our the book of our confessions. What we're not saying is that you know, if you're a Lutheran, you have to agree with every random historical claim or scientific claim. You know, there, there is a weird thing about garlic and magnets that is just not something that we actually believe scientifically is the case. So, uh, you're not obligated to believe that to be a Lutheran. But it's the, the doctrinal points that are debated and the explanation of those doctrinal points, those are the things that you are affirming if you are a confessional Lutheran. You're not affirming if... A certain father is quoted by the Lutheran confessions and, you know, modern scholarship has demonstrated that, hey, they attributed that treatise to the wrong guy that you've got to say, well, but my confessions say it. I don't care what the evidence is. It's true because I have to affirm it. We're not talking about an inerrancy of the Lutheran confessions, in other words. It's not that the Lutheran confessions have no errors in any way at all. But what it is saying is, is that as a Lutheran, you affirm the basic doctrinal points that are set forth in, in these confessions. Okay, so maybe to make a quick differentiation here between two kinds of Lutherans that both adhere to confessions, there, there are those Lutherans who hold, especially in Germany, to the entirety of the Book of Concord, meaning that we affirm this whole, this whole set of documents that are confessions of faith. There are other Lutherans, however, in some other countries, who simply affirmed the Augsburg Confession of 1530 and Luther's Small Catechism of 1529. And that doesn't mean that they totally disagree with these other documents, but not every church, and you have a number of state Lutheran churches, not every church affirms the entirety of the Book of Concord. Some places saw this based, the, the later documents as ah, just a bunch of German controversies. <laughs> so, so to be a Lutheran means that you affirm the Augsburg Confession and the Small Catechism. That's, that's kind of the minimum, okay? The, those are the most basic clear statements of what Lutheran theology is. Everything else really depends on those two documents. It's an expansion of those two documents. So if you look at the whole of the Lutheran Confession that say this looks too overwhelming, there's so much here, read the Augsburg Confession and read the Small Catechism because that's really going to give you the, the basis. Okay, so what are these documents? The Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession is a confession of faith that was written primarily by Philip Melanchthon, though not only. It was not written by Luther. And this was a confession that was presented at the Diet of Augsburg before Emperor Charles, the same one that we had discussed at the Diet of Worms earlier. So in 1530, there was an opportunity for the, the Lutheran princes, because there are a number of princes that have converted at this point, uh, along with theologians that are there, to present their faith and to be able to read it out loud publicly and declare to the emperor, this is what we teach. And largely the purpose of the Augsburg Confession is to say, we are not departing from the church Catholic. We're not bringing out all of these theological novelties. It, 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 even though they've been accused of all of these crazy heresies, they're saying, no, we're, we're teaching what the church Catholic has always taught. What we're arguing against is abuses that have happened in the late Middle Ages. So you have the Augsburg Confession, which it goes article by article on all sorts of doctrines. It's the best place to start. And then there's the apology of the Augsburg Confession. Apology, not meaning you're sorry for it, but apology meaning defense, apologia. So this is the older way of using the term apology, like when we're talking about apologetics. Now, the apology is a defense of the Augsburg Confession written by Philip Melanchthon. So he's responding to Eck and his criticisms, there are others as well, but largely Eck, his criticisms of the Augsburg Confession, and clarifying and defending. So it's a further explanation of what the Augsburg Confession is saying. You have Luther's small catechism and his large catechism. Now, these catechisms were written right around the same time, but 1529, and they were written by Luther after what are called the Saxon visitations in Luther's life, where he goes throughout Saxony and visits a bunch of congregations to see What's being taught there? How are churches functioning? And he starts to see that there is a lack of education even among the priests over the basic things of the faith. I mean, he talks about how some priests have no idea what the Ten, what the Ten Commandments are. I mean, you know, they, can't, they can't name them. So Luther recognizes the importance of having documents that are going to outline the basic teachings of the Christian faith. 
And so you have the small catechism, which is written for for children. It's supposed to be taught by by the father at home with his children. So this is something that's supposed to be kind of a family activity. The large catechism then was written for pastors or other you know adults to use as as catechesis. The large catechism is is in a a, a more paragraph by paragraph essay kind of format. It was really based on sermons. Whereas the small catechism is a question and answer thing, which is meant for the purpose of memorization. So the small catechism is broken up into five basic sections. So you have the you have the Ten Commandments. You then have the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, uh, Holy Baptism, and the Lord's Supper. And so these are the basic elements of Christianity. That even a lot of non-Lutherans look at the small catechism and say, "Yeah, this is a great summary of." of the Christian faith. It's not like the small catechism as written to be this polemical debated text. It's just laying out the, the basics of, of the Christian faith. So then we have the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope. This is the most polemical of any of the documents and it's against the abuses of the papacy written by Philip Melanchthon in 1537. And also speaking of polemical writings, the small guild articles written in 1537 by Martin Luther, deal with a lot of the contentious issues going on in the church. And this is a lot more blunt, I'll say, than something like the Augsburg Confession is about the abuses that are happening in the church at the time. And and it's at this point where it became obvious that Rome really does not have any desire for an actual in-person discussion, debate, council that that was hoped for initially. At at that point, the, the hopes for that had really been lost and and so Luther is a lot more direct there I think without without having those hopes that some kind of reconciliation is going to happen anytime in the in the near future at least uh, then we have these other two documents that were written in the 1570s now these documents come out of some theological debates that happened after Luther's death and this is true with any movement. When you have a significant figure that's leading that movement and that figure dies, the next generation is going to fight a lot about who's in charge <laughs> and what did our other leader mean by certain things that he said and what direction are we going to go in now? So after Luther's death, Melanchthon is to simply not have, Melanchthon's a great scholar, he's a great theologian, but he does not have the kind of leadership capabilities of, of a Martin Luther. And so who was going to fill those shoes? Well, thankfully, we don't have this just line of, you know, new Luthers, this line of, well, we've got to have our, our, you know, head guy who's really charismatic and a great leader to all just follow. (laughs) You know, we're not we're not Mormons, you know, with the prophet at the head of the church. That's a very unhealthy way for a church to to function. So if there was just some direct line of people like Luther, it wouldn't have been healthy. Um, But what we do have is a number of wonderful theologians that's debate a number of issues and come together to write about what are some of the debated points. And so Martin Chemnitz and Jacob Andre are the most significant, though there are others as well. So they're, they get together and write uh, the solid declaration and the epitome of uh, the formula of Concord. And then all of this is compiled together in what is called the Book of Concord. So if you want all of these confessions, by the Book of Concord. And in the Book of Concord, you'll have all of this. And oftentimes you'll also have some other little things, something called the Catalog of Testimonies in there and some other things as well, which I just don't have the time to get into here. Okay, Um, then I have Lutheran doctrine here and I'm looking at our time here and it's getting kind of close, but uh, this will be very quick. And why it's going to be very quick is not because the doctrine is not important. It's because we have a whole separate hour on Lutheran doctrine. <laughs> so we'll get we'll get to the specifics here of Lutheran theology. But just uh, this is very, very quick overview. Here are some of the main points that distinguish Lutheran doctrine. One is justification through faith alone. This is probably the most key doctrine that Luther, Martin Luther is known for. The, the teaching that we are righteous not by any human works, but by the work of Christ, and we receive the work of Christ through the act of faith. And so it is faith rather than works that gives us righteousness, that gives us a proper standing before God, and that's that's through the gift of Christ's righteousness, which is granted in faith. The supremacy of scriptural authority, and what I mean by that is that scripture is the only infallible authority that guides the church. 
in, and I use the term supremacy purposefully just because I think that there is a misunderstanding of sola scriptura, I affirm sola scriptura, certainly, uh, on the part of many Protestants today that is an idea that scripture is the only authority. We're not saying scripture is the only authority. We're saying scripture is the highest authority and it's the only infallible authority. So it doesn't negate things like the authority of your pastor uh, or something like that, um, or, or the proper and good role of tradition. Salvation by grace alone, that it's solely grace that brings us into the Christian faith and keeps us in, in the Christian faith so that we can take no credit for our salvation. Sacramental efficacy. Luther is a very sacramental theologian, and Lutheranism is a very sacramental faith. So we emphasize baptism. We believe that baptism actually regenerates. It brings grace. It is a, is a means of grace. It actually saves. Eucharistic realism. What I mean by realism is that what we have in the Eucharist is the actual body and blood of Christ. We receive Christ's body, we receive Christ's blood as we partake of Holy Communion. Note, I didn't use the term consubstantiation because that's not actually a term that Lutherans use. It's just one that is placed on us for some reason. Uh, then absolution. We believe that God has delivered the authority to forgive sins to the office of the Holy Ministry, that when the pastor is standing you know, in front of the congregation or in front of the, the penitent in, in another kind of private confessional situation, he stands in the place of Christ and is then able, not just able, but called to forgive sins. What we call the keys of the kingdom of heaven is spoken about in Matthew 16, Matthew 18, and John 20. Word and sacrament. So Lutherans emphasize both the word of God the power of the word of God, the efficacy of the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, as well as the sacraments. So we believe that these, these are both means of grace and we need to hold both of them in a very high position. Whereas some Protestants really hold word far over sacrament, that preaching is really the most important thing in the service. And sometimes within the Roman tradition, the Eucharist is really the most important thing in the service and preaching is de-emphasized. We try to have a balance of both of those, recognizing that those are both essential elements of, of what it means to worship, what it means to come to, uh, together before God, and as a means that God uh, uses to work his grace in us. Uh, the two kinds of righteousness. This is a distinction between the righteousness that we need to stand before God, which is received solely through faith, which is the righteousness of Christ, as well as active righteousness, which is the righteous deeds or good works that we do for the sake of our neighbor. So Lutheranism does not in any way deny the reality of good works, the importance of good works. <clears throat> it simply recognizes the distinction between the righteousness that saves and then the righteousness that we live out in this world for the sake of others. Uh, the three estates. Three estates is a theme that shows up in Luther, which is a recognition that God works differently in different spheres. And there are three primary spheres that really structure society, and that is the state, um, and then we have the church, and the family. And so the state, the church, and the family all have our institutions created by God and all have distinct roles and functions, and that those things must not be confused. So that leads to a lot of discussion about things like, like political theory, what is the connection between the church and the state. This is not a complete separation of church and state as you see in the Enlightenment era, but it is a recognition that God works differently in different spheres, and that for society to function well, we need to know the difference between what those three spheres are and how they interact with one another. Uh, and the final point I have, which I think is a really key one, especially for this idea of conservative reformation, is orders of authority and call. It is an essential part of Lutheran doctrine that we believe in the, the reality, the importance of proper order. That's both true in society and within the church. And so what, why this is significant is that within a Lutheran theological context, you cannot just decide one day that you're a pastor with no training and then start a Bible study and then decide that that's now a church. But there is a proper way that God has instituted that he uses to call people to the office of the holy ministry. And, and there has to be an examination, education, there is a you know, laying on of hands, an ordination. So all of these things are, are connected to what it means to receive a divine call. And I put that there because that, first of all, that's a huge theme in Luther. It shows up all over the place in Luther. And it's in response to the Anabaptists. But I think in our day, because of the 
rise of this kind of non-denominationalism, anti-institutionalism, anti-authority approach that we see in some of the church, it's really essential that we emphasize that. Um, now, let's look at who are some just important theologians. Uh, who are some of the kind of major figures that we're talking about in Lutheranism? And this is the final slide that I have here. Um, well, the first and obvious one is Martin Luther. Right? So that one, we know, okay? We know Luther. His name is stuck there in our names, so everybody knows Luther. But I think the unfortunate thing is a lot of people I talk to from outside of the Lutheran tradition, uh, you know, when I mention Lutheranism, and Lutheran theologians, they've never heard of anybody except Luther. And it gives this idea that ah, that's all, we only had that one guy. <laughs> no, nobody else after that really had anything good to say. Um, no, but there, there are some wonderful writers, theologians, uh, devotional writers, and this is just a small selection of them. So who I've, what I've chosen to do, I basically grabbed the number six and said, I'm going to put up the, you know, the, the six most essential, maybe I should have done seven because that's the holy, holier number, right? But <laughs> I don't know. But uh these are six major figures that have shaped Lutheran theology probably more, more than anybody else. Um, and I think definitely more than anybody else, actually. Um, which is why, which is kind of why I was like, I, I don't know if there is a, a good seventh that kind of, there are plenty of great theologians, but that would quite um, live up to these names in terms of influence, at least. So this doesn't mean these are the best theologians within Lutheranism, by the way. This is just saying these are the ones that have the most significant impact. First, we've got Martin Luther, obviously, Philip Melanchthon. Now, Philip Melanchthon was, you know, he was the kind of right-hand man of Martin Luther. Um, but, you know, not not only that, but Melanchthon also wrote significant portions of our of our confessions. So he was the major writer of the Augsburg Confession. He was the author of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. He was the author of the Power and Primacy of the Pope, which means that Melanchthon wrote more of our confessional documents than anyone else. And Melanchthon wrote some wonderful theological works. He wrote a great commentary on Romans. Melanchthon was a wonderful scholar. He was in that humanist tradition that you see within the Renaissance. Very different kind of mind than Luther, which I think is really good. Uh, I think that was very healthy to have these different kinds of minds coming together. Martin Chemnitz then. Martin Chemnitz is the first real systematician of the Lutheran Church. Now, Melanchthon was systematic, but Chemnitz was in that second generation. So, in that generation of, of theologians, Chemnitz was able to take the works of Luther, the works of Melanchthon, the things they talked about, and really systematize them, create the the helpful categories, do some contrasting work, put a lot of nuance to the developments that had happened in the era of the Reformation. And Chemnitz becomes the major author of the Formula of Concord, along with Andre as well. Um, so, so if there was a seventh on here, it would probably be Andre, uh, but Chemnitz really does, I think, stand significantly above Andre and his theological ability. Andre's great, don't get me wrong. Uh, okay, then you have Johann Gerhard, that's the one in the picture here. So his years are 1582 to 1637, and Gerhard is the, the most significant figure of what is often labeled Lutheran orthodoxy, sometimes called Lutheran scholasticism. He is the thinker that has the most extensive systematic theological writing that just defends Lutheranism point by point by point in the most minute little details. But along with that, this is why Gerhard is, uh, uh, I think, so wonderful. He was also probably the best devotional writer within the entire Lutheran tradition. I mean, he is a, a deep piety, a deep spirituality. The theology, though he was so academically gifted, was not just an academic exercise. Uh, Gerhard was, was a very devoted Christian and had a very active life of, of prayer and piety. So we do have some plenty of other scholastics after that. Some of them get even more scholastic and more detailed about particulars. Um, but Gerhard, I think, strikes the balance best of any of these figures. Then you have uh, Johann Arndt. Uh, his years are 1555 to 1621. Arndt was a... He was the most influential devotional writer within the Lutheran tradition. He wrote a series of four volumes titled True Christianity. And this was really the, at the time, it was known as the best-selling work of theology ever. There are some scholars of, of Lutheranism and of Pietism, which is a movement later within Lutheranism, 
that have said that Arndt's influence is so significant within the Lutheran tradition that it may surpass even that of Luther himself. Now, Arndt is not as well loved today. He's not as well known as the other figures, probably by most people. But Arndt's influence devotionally was so significant that he was used within Russian Orthodox seminaries. Uh, he was translated into so many different languages. He, he was read widely by the Reformed, even by Roman Catholics. Uh, so Arndt was, was massive in his influence. Whatever you think about him, because there's critiques of Arndt, so you may not like him. But again, this isn't the question of who are the best theologians, but this is who are the ones that are the most uh, significant in the tradition. And then finally, we have Philip Jacob Spainer. His years are 1635 to 1705. And Spainer is the, the founder of pietism. Uh, pietism being a movement that develops toward the end of the 17th century, really has its, its kind of major heyday, I guess, you want to use that term, uh, you know, in the 1700s, so in the 18th century. And the 18th century becomes basically for Lutheranism the, the century of pietism. Now, pietism is a movement that's widely criticized, and, and there's a lot I could say about pietism, but it is a movement within Lutheranism that is trying to move away from what was perceived to be a kind of dead orthodoxy, uh, that there was an idea that, and this seems to be the case from what you read historically at the time, that within some Lutheran churches, there were people who were so, who so loved the particularities of Lutheran orthodoxy, which I love those things, but that the sermons were basically these lengthy doctrinal expositions. There was no real pastoral care. There was no care for the average Christian life, really. It was, we debate doctrine and talk doctrine, and, and that's it, which is not the purpose of the role of the pastor and, and the purpose of the sermon. There's doctrinal instruction, but not solely that. Um, so, so Spainer is the founder of a movement that gets the name Pietism, which is a, a movement that emphasizes regeneration, emphasizes a changed heart. The way that Pietism, and Pia Desideria is his major work, and he, he has a number of reforms that he proposes, and the major of those is that he's promoting Bible studies, what we would think today as small group Bible studies. If you're in a small group Bible study in any way, you are indebted to, to Spainer in some way. That that really was, he was the one who really emphasized that and had an impact all over the place in all sorts of traditions as well. Um, all right. So again, Spainer is criticized a lot. People don't like pietism, but Spainer cannot be left out of any history of Lutheranism. And I will say that Regardless of the errors that later pietism often had, Spanier was quite Lutheran in his doctrinal convictions, and he was repeatedly clear about that as well. Well, uh, that's the end of uh, our introduction to Lutheranism, and I hope you found this helpful to give you a basic idea of where Lutherans come from, what Lutheran theology is, and then who some of the major figures or theologians or thinkers that have shaped our tradition might be. And, you know, maybe I should have included a slide to <clears throat> differentiate different Lutheran groups. And I'll probably, why don't I just do this really quick, even though it's not on here. Sorry, no slide, but just quickly to say this. Um, because I do get this question a lot. How, who are you talking about with, with Lutheranism? Because you may just look at a Lutheran church uh, you know, down the street, and you perhaps go to that Lutheran church, and they don't seem to have doctrinal convictions at all, and you know, perhaps they have um, more progressive views of gender and sexuality than Scripture does. And th those churches that you find that teach those kinds of things uh, are, are not what we would refer to as confessional Lutherans. They they do not hold to our confessions of faith. Uh, they do not hold to really even the principle of sola scriptura if you're going to say that scripture is wrong about certain things that it's you, you're denying sola scriptura uh so the the part of the lutheran tradition that i am that, that i am a part of is uh well I, i'm part of a church body called the aalc the american association of lutheran churches we're, we're very small we are in full fellowship with the lutheran church of missouri synod which is the bigger church body that probably is is certainly more more well known than than we are um, 
but we are part of a broader group called the ILC, the International Lutheran Conference. And the ILC includes church bodies all around the world who hold to confessional Lutheranism. They hold to our confessions of faith. So you can find churches that are part of the ILC all over the place. There is another group of, of Lutheran churches that is called the LWF, the Lutheran World Federation. Uh, and those churches tend to be more on the progressive side of things. So if you're looking at, you know, the, the churches with rainbow flags, that's probably a LWF church. So that would be something like the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. All right, it's important to know that, to know the distinction between the two. So if you're looking for a confessional Lutheran church and, you know, you're in the United States, uh, I would say, you know, look for an AALC church. That's what I'm a part of. Uh, if not, if there's none around, you can look for an LCMS church, sister church body of ours, uh, which you're more likely to find one around you than you are an ALC church. Um, so, which, <laughs> you know, I preach often at LCMS churches. So, uh, And then you also have some of the probably the most conservative churches and the most strict uh, Lutheran churches would be uh, Wells uh, and ELS. So that would be the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod and the, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Um, or is that what ELS stands for? I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm not that familiar with the ELS, obviously. So um, then you also have this kind of moderate churches like the NALC, the North American Lutheran Church, or the LCMC, the Lutheran Churches of Mission for Christ. And those churches are, you know, theologically, some and and culturally as well and ethically, somewhere between what you have in the confessional Lutheran churches like the LCMS or AALC, and then what you have in the ELCA. So they would kind of be a, a middle perspective um, there. So just a broad lay of the land of broader Lutheran groups. So again, thanks so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe if you want more of this type of content. And I will be following this up with a video that explains the specifics of Lutheran theology. God bless.